switching kind of uh, from some other t types of topics to uh, something that I'd say kind of impacts most, if not all of us in our practices, is figuring out um, kind of who has capacity to make decisions and there's legal uh, aspects as well as ethical aspects to that. So we're very pleased to have uh, Merritt Ann Peterson uh, presenting today. She's the Associate Director for the Mil Minnesota Elder Justice Center, which I assume she'll explain to us. Um, prior to that, uh, she, she practiced estate planning and elder law in the Twin Cities, uh, past chair and current member of the Governing Council of the Minnesota State Bar Association Elder Law Section. Uh, she also teaches at Augsburg in the Philosophy Department uh, and teaches ethics there. And uh, she's been on the um, Minnesota Olmstead Specialty Committee for Prevention of Abuse and uh, the Honoring Choices Minnesota Advisory Board. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you okay. very much, Secretary. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to stand up and lift this microphone up off of the uh, stand. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, if anybody ca cannot hear me because I allow the microphone to drift away from my mouth, please just let me know with the speak up or bring the mic back uh, gesture. And I just I want to thank everybody again for inviting me to be here today. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak with you, and uh, it's 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 a great honor actually to to stand in the room with you and talk with you about this concept, um, or these concepts, this collection of concepts. I actually I want to start by acknowledging I think there are probably many people here in the room who have a much broader experience with clinical capacity assessment certainly than I do. Um, I know uh, in my in my introduction. Uh, referred a little bit to my professional experience, but I'm an attorney, and so I'm looking at these issues from the perspective of the law and the way that the law intersects for older adults with decisions that get made in a context where you may be more likely to be operating, so a clinical context. Um, and what I've wanted to offer today is really just an introduction to the way that lawyers and advocates are thinking about capacity now and the way that that is going to inform, I think, the way that clinicians and attorneys and advocates um, discuss capacity and related issues going forward as a concept both in healthcare and in the law. So I, I really, I want to set a foundation for that discussion. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have as we go forward. Again, not being a clinician, I'm not going to talk about clinical assessment more so than just talking about what we know as advocates to be general issues with broad assessment. So I will talk a little bit about that. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge there's just a tremendous amount of expertise in the room, so if you have questions that are germane to the, to the uh, topic that we're exploring today related to capacity and capacity determinations, um, there may be somebody in the room today who has some reflection that would be useful. So please feel free to ask those questions and we'll try to take the time that we need to explore the ideas and the issues. So I'm talking about concepts and capacity, and I'm here from the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. We're a nonprofit organization, and we're focused on preventing and alleviating abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation for older and vulnerable Minnesotans. You can see our focus here on abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. And so we'll talk a little bit about what connects this issue with those issues as we go through the presentation today. But we do our work in, in four primary ways. We do a lot of education, so public and professional education. Professional education, I'm here today. We also do public policy and advocate for, um, advocate for laws that will positively impact the lives of older and vulnerable Minnesotans, particularly in the areas of the prevention of abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. We also do direct service, which makes our organization somewhat unique in the realm of elder justice centers or elder justice focused organizations across the country, because we not only do education and policy advocacy, but we do offer direct advocacy services and some limited purpose legal representation as well for older or vulnerable adults who have experienced or are concerned about experiences of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. So I can talk more a little bit about that if there are any questions at the end. But just so you know, if you ever need to access a victim services advocate at the Elder Justice Center, if you have technical questions about the law as it applies to older or vulnerable adults, if you're interested in information about what will happen, for example, if a person were to uh, make a report, we can share that information. There are advocates and attorneys in our office who are available to answer questions, both from consumers and from professionals. When we're giving professional information to other professionals who serve older or vulnerable adults, that falls within our mission. We call it technical assistance, which I used to always think involved or implied that we were giving 
IT advice, but n not really, no, we're really just giving more technical subject matter specific advice to professionals who are serving the same participants that we serve in our direct service work. So there's a form on our website, there's a phone number you can call. If this would ever be helpful to you or to anybody that you're serving, please feel free to use it. One thing that I like to share with professionals about this, and then I'll move on from our work at the Elder Justice Center, is that one of the things that I'm really proud to say that we're able to do in our direct service work, our advocacy work at the Elder Justice Center, is spend a tremendous amount of time, sometimes hours, empathetic listening to folks who call in with a need. If you are working with somebody who would benefit from that, you should connect them with us because we are able to do that. And that's something special I think that we can provide at the Elder Justice Center that a lot of our professional colleagues who are serving participants in similar ways are not able to offer just because of demands on their time. So I just wanna offer that. Uh, we again will we'll talk with folks about a range of issues. What we are generally oriented towards is responding to questions or concerns that people might have that again are related to experiences of abuse or the prevention of abuse experiences of neglect or prevention of neglect, or financial exploitation. So if, if you're working with somebody who would, would benefit from conversations around that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And here's what I'm gonna explore today, absolutely. We have uh, chairs up front. Yeah, there are a few chairs, there's three chairs, there are three or four chairs up here. So if anybody needs one. Yeah, I do understand that. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm standing. To, I was. I committed to sitting, and now I immediately start. And then immediately started lurking and walking around. So I, I, I get it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the meaning of capacity, what it means culturally, what it means in the law. I want to talk about expressions of capacity. Again, for you who are doing clinical assessment, the range of expressions of capacity will not be lost on you. But I want to talk a little bit about the way that impacts our participants, especially when they're ga engaging with other professionals purposes for assessment and challenges in application. And you're gonna hear a repetitive message from me. I've already brought it up once, and it's related to time. The particular challenge of application in the discussion about capacity and making decisions or trying to make assessments around another person's capacity is how much time we have to gather meaningful information from that individual. It is absolutely the single most major barrier, I think, for all of us, whether attorneys or clinicians or in other professional capacities with regard to determinations of capacity. I do wanna make a couple of special acknowledgements today, and these are, uh, in particular, if you are looking for additional resources on these subjects, I cannot hesitate to recommend the National Center on Law and Elder Rights. They have a very navigable website, um, and they have a tremendous amount of information about issues that impact participants that we serve in particular. And then the American Bar Association's Commission on Law and Aging also has a wide range of resources available, even for folks who are non-attorneys and not members of the American Bar Association. And in particular, I'm gonna to gesture towards a document that I'm actually gonna quote from in the presentation called The Ten Commandments of Mental Capacity and the Law, which is a really useful article that I find highlights some of the issues that we're going to explore together today in a, in a meaningful way. Thus, I will point at it. So, uh, autonomy, capacity, and consent. My first stop in question when we receive inquiry in our direct service participant line, helpline, about autonomy, capacity, and consent is who is asking and why do they want to know? <laughs> That's a really preliminary question. Who's asking? Is it the individual themselves who called and has a question? They've been told something, they need some additional information, they're curious, they're making some observation about their own experience that they wanna ask about? Or is it somebody else calling to ask a question about a person that I'm not talking to? You know, there's a lot of, there's a, there's, there are big distinctions there. So I always wanna know who's asking. And then in general, when we talk about capacity, if we are not specifying capacity for what and under what circumstances, and frankly, when, we are not talking about anything meaningful. We're not having a meaningful conversation. Capacity is an empty set. It refers to nothing unless we specify capacity for what. Right? Even when we just say generally capacity, as clinicians, as attorneys, I mean, are we talking about decisional capacity? Are we talking about some other form of reasoning? Are we talking about contractual capacity within the law? Am I talking about the capacity that's required in order for somebody to make a healthcare decision or give informed consent or execute a healthcare directive or have a conversation related to provider order for life-sustaining treatment? What are, we, what are we asking about whether somebody has capacity for? Because for many different things, the level of capacity that needs to be demonstrated in the law 
is different. And I think f for your purposes as well, in, clini in a clinical context, right? A, we're looking for different things. So this is true in the law as well. When we start to look at the variety of different things that we're actually examining, my, uh, another theme that you might hear from me is how, how meaningful really are, are broad references to capacity. I would argue that they have very limited meaning given what we know we need to specify to have meaningful conversations about capacity. So whether we're talking about decisional capacity, whether we're talking about any of these various forms that I've mentioned up until now, we have to specify. And until we do, we're just talking about the ability or power to do something, feel something, think something, respond to something. Capacity covers all of those experiences, and if we don't specify what we're talking about, then we're referring to this huge range, this big empty bucket. And I will specify at a particular moment in time, right? Because capacity can change for the same individual over the course of time. I'm not even gonna say over the course of the day, right? Over the course of some hours, capacity can change. So we're talking about, again, what exactly are we wanting to have this mean for us if we're talking about a specific set of variables, specific instances, specific understandings at specific moments in time? We can extrapolate some interesting information from that and we'll talk about how we have to be able to do that in some ways as clinicians and attorneys, but it's just a really interesting question, I think. The further we specify, the more meaningful our information is, but the more individual it is and the more time it takes to get to the answer that we're looking for. So some kind of, some happy medium here, anyway. Um, capacity and competency, I wanna talk just briefly about the way this language is used. I, when I first started to talk about these issues, I could pretty reliably say, when we talk about capacity, we're generally talking about making a clinical assessment about somebody's decisional capacity or other form of sort of um, processing, thinking, considering. And when we talk about competency, we're most likely talking about a legal determination or legal decisions, whether somebody can participate in a particular kind of a, a legal action. Increasingly, that is not the case. Increasingly, we're moving away from language of competency, even in court systems. One of the kind of legacy uses of competency remains, be, remains in some states discussions of guardianship conservatorship. But even in Minnesota, we no longer use the language of competency when we, re when we discuss guardianship and conservatorship, probably the most onerous legal impositions on a person's decisional rights. We now use the language of capacity when we're talking about guardianship and conservatorship. So we don't even use competency in Minnesota anymore to refer to these issues. Um, However, so, so this has some meaning to us as professionals because we aren't necessarily relying on those distinctions to understand the realm of, uh, of our discussions. But uh, I, I will observe our clients uh, and, and uh, patients, residents, they are using this language very interchangeably. So we need to, I think, remember or hold at least those sort of coordinate meetings in some tension. Because even if we recognize that there's not really a distinction between legal and medical contexts or, or legal and healthcare contexts in this language, I think sometimes our, our participants may see a distinction or, or may not. And so in any case, to be prepared for the coincidence of this language. And in some instances, we do still find courts making competency determinations. Probably most significantly, we'll hear of whether or not a person is competent to participate in a, a legal um, uh, uh, process, competent to stand trial, competent to provide testimony. So those are the instances in which we might continue to hear that language. So we think at the Elder Justice Center about participants that call their, the helpline as subjects to empower regardless of what they communicate to us about any prior capacity determination or any concern that somebody has expressed to them about capacity. And we do get a lot of folks calling the helpline who have been told, you know, there's some imposition on their decisional capacity and therefore they have to take some legal action and they have questions about that, legitimately so. So we try to start from this place where we're recognizing capacity where it exists to the best of our ability. And that's our starting point. And that's generally the starting point of advocates when we're talking about advocacy from a person-centered position, whether they're attorneys or whether they're people who are providing support or information in other contexts. It's this starting to recognize capacity where it exists. A focus, of course, then in, in assessment to some extent on what a person's capabilities are versus what a person's deficits may be. So how can we identify what a person is able to do successfully? And then we wanna make sure that, that 
in doing so, we're supporting that individual agency. So remembering that, you know, within that ability to do things successfully is, it remains a, a many sets of decisions around those issues that a person can express for themselves. And we know for all our, our callers on the participant line, capacity is not black and white, it's a continuum. Again, we talked a little bit about this, not lost on you, different for different people, different times of day, different circumstances. So we do this, focusing on abilities, and then we also recognize that certainly a person may have capacity to do one thing and not another thing. And in fact, they may have legal capacity to do one thing and not another thing. There are different levels of capacity required to enter into different kinds of legal arrangements. So the type of capacity required to enter into a contract differs from the type of capacity that needs to be demonstrated if a person wants to make a testamentary assignment, so something, some assignment about what will happen with the things they own after they die. So we know that a person might have capacity to make a decision in one realm of their life and not have capacity to make a decision in another realm. And of course, varying degrees of capacity are required for various purposes. Right? The capacity that's required of me, even if I'm gonna just, just describe kind of without using legal thresholds at all, the decisional capacity required for me to sit down and analyze a rental agreement is different than the capacity that is required in order for me to listen to an audiobook. Those are just different, different levels of capacity to require, to require to accomplish different things that I might do in my day-to-day -day life. So there are multiple roles as, as we've been talking through this and, and the, the sort of describing certain circumstances we might find ourselves in. Um, and this is some of the ways that we can see these multiple roles manifest. You know, we, we see that in, in many cases there are state laws that create standards of capacity for legal tasks. I've talked a little bit about this so far. Um, and then in that sense, clinicians provide evidence about a person's capacity for attorneys who are presenting information about a person's capacity in that legal context. And then when that information is presented to a court, the court takes that evidence and whatever other evidence it provides and make a determination about capacity or whether or not certain rights are available to people in court settings related to those assertions. So sort of layers of roles here. In the law, legal capacity to do most, to, to meet most legal objectives is really the ability to give informed consent. And consent is informed when a person understands that, that they have a, a choice in front of them, understands a range of options that's avail that are available in terms of making that choice. It's not gonna differ significantly from informed consent in a healthcare context. Um, a person understand risk and benefit, so can articulate some specific risks that might endure from the choice that they make, and then the reason that they might make the choice, um, that they assert a choice, uh, eventually, uh, and so again, the time frame thing here, how much time does a person have to review, to consider, to make a choice? How much time do we afford a person to do that? Um, and then understands ultimately that the, what, how the outcome is related to the choice that's been made. So this is what we're looking for in the law when it comes to informed consent and the legal capacity to, uh, to make certain kinds of decisions. And the standards that we're considering here are, uh, in part, uh, contractual standards, testamentary standards, arguably um, the standard to enter into a healthcare directive in Minnesota, which is not specified in state law. So uh, the, the, that capacity can be interpreted as contractual capacity. The contract for a healthcare directive to enter into a proxy agreement with another person is pretty much, hey, will you make my healthcare decisions for me? That's what I want. Yes, I will make your healthcare decisions for you. So as you can see, this is not a particularly complex contract. If we, if we, if we look at the, the way that we wanna understand contractual capacity, which is risks and benefits, if a person understands that they want someone else to make their healthcare decisions for them and is able to clearly express that in the way that we would need them to in order to enter into a legal agreement, so in a healthcare directive, for example, we have a need for a signature and a notarization or two disinterested witnesses to witness that attestation. So in any case, we have that option here. But some people will argue that that is, and I have argued in the past that that's a separate standard. It's not a contractual standard. It's its own standard. There's a testamentary standard, which is I understand what I own and I can give instructions about it and I understand how, if I'm gonna change instructions, how, the, how those instructions might differ from what would normally happen to the things that I own. 
The testamentary standard is long established in law, but it differs slightly from that contractual standard. It's asking somebody to hold on to some information about, what, about who they are, what they own, outside of what's in the contents of a document. Uh, notice that here, there, these are a couple, we have some, in, in some situations, you know, other standards, decisional standards or standards for understanding will be called out in the law. But, not, but I do want to point at a handful of other documents that might come up for you that we typically look at as, as interpreted as requiring a, contra a contractual capacity. And those are things like powers of attorney for finance, they're powers of attorney for health care, and they are also... Um, uh, documents like um, deeds, rental agreements, these kinds of documents. So these are contracts, and in order to enter into these kinds of agreements, a person needs to demonstrate contact contractual capacity. So understand, what, is the do what does the contract contain? Do they need to be able to demonstrate that they have a complete and total understanding of all of the legal details of the contract? No, no, not, not necessarily. They don't need to be able to repeat legal concepts using legalese, but people need to generally be able to understand what risks and what benefits they gain from the particular agreement. And a rental agreement, you know, any other kind of service contract. So these are legal standards of capacity. And when we talk about legal standards of capacity, I like to look to the American Bar Association, and I have to share with you the American Bar Association's 10 Commandments of Capacity in the Law. So I'll just take a few minutes to go through these because I think they are so meaningful. And I will also quickly do a time check since I have a tendency to get excited and talk, <laughs> talk beyond my, my time. Um, so I like this. Uh, uh, the 10 Commandments of Capacity in the Law uh, w was uh, was presented in the ABA Bifocal Magazine, which is directed towards elder law attorneys. So this is, or folks who are connected with this work. Um, so, so these commandments were, were given specifically to attorneys who are working with older adults. Keep this in mind, right? We need to be reminded about this constantly, constantly. So, uh, thou shalt presume capacity is the first commandment. And, and I think this is kind of where we begin in, in our advocacy work. Just again, how to understand that a person, you know, understanding that a person is coming to us, having made a set of decisions to reach out, or if a person that somebody else is calling about um, with a concern, uh, that we begin by, uh, by begin at a place where we're, we're allowing that person to make decisions about their own life and, and, uh, and, and uh, assert their own choices um, versus listening to the decisions that somebody else is maybe making or asserting on their behalf or attempting to on their behalf. Um, for attorneys, thou shalt talk to the client alone. This is critically important. Um, this is a professional obligation that attorneys have in order to ensure that the direction that they're getting is, is clear and to establish a confidential relationship with the client. But this is a critical piece to be able to talk to the client alone. Um, this is an opportunity also to ensure that um, there's at least a moment in which a person could come out from any particular influence of another. Um, and I see this, I, when I, while I say this, I also want to emphasize, because I do find when we're talking about capacity um, in, in some other professional contexts, I, kind of, I can kind of lose the forest for the trees. Um, so I always want to be able to talk to the client alone, outside of or, or a step away from the influence of any other persons to ascertain whether or not there's any information that the client wants to communicate to me about the nature of those relationships. At the same time, after I've had a moment with the client alone, if the client wants other people in the appointment with them and they understand what it means for them to have other people hearing the conversation that they're having with me, they absolutely get to decide that. I know this is not lost on you, most likely in this room, but I will say that that fact often is lost on many of our peers who have less, um, have had fewer opportunities to work collaboratively in this way with older adults. It's sort of this idea that um, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I might be in, in violation of confidentiality if I have a conversation in front of somebody else, or et cetera, but, that we, but we kind of forget that a person can simply give permission. They can give permission to involve other people in the conversation, to receive support from other people in their lives. So this kind of plays both ways. Of course, we want to talk to the client or the patient or resident alone if we can when we're first making these assessments. But then eventually we do want to take direction from that person too. We're presuming capacity and allowing that person to say, yeah, I do. I want my daughter to be in the room when I have this conversation. I want, I want her to hear. Okay. 
Maximizing client abilities, again, how and when, I talk a little, I'll talk a little bit later on about how to make uh, environments comfortable and feel um, safe for clients that uh, would allow them to share and express themselves openly without major imposition, making sure they have any kind of resources that they would need to communicate with you in the way that they need to. Again, not lost on clinicians here. Uh, <laughs> Thou shalt not worship any one standard for capacity. I like this one in particular. Again, when we talk about standards for capacity in the law, we know they can change. But this to me refers to, even most powerfully, this sort of tendency that we may have to just talk about capacity very generally and broadly, and to say things like, well, that person has, is incapacitated, but without specifying <laughs> in what way or for what purpose or to what end or receiving assistance to achieve what goals. Uh, I don't think the mini mental status exam even features that prominently. You can answer that question for me. Um, but I know when, maybe when this study was published, it was definitely something that we were hearing more about or that was being relied upon by folks who really are not necessarily in a position to interpret the results of that exam um, or to really even uh, make decisions <laughs> based on information gathered in the, uh, that exam about how people were going to engage with the world going forward. So uh, I think this really, this number five in particular emphasizes this idea that not only is there, uh, you know, number four and five not one standard, there's also not one single assessment that yields a result that applies to any given situation, and in particular, any given legal situation. Because the legal standards for capacity are specific, and they may or may not be addressed by any single clinical assessment. Um, again, <laughs> number six, uh, uh, capacity for what is our question. What are we asking about? What kinds of decisions, under what circumstances, for what purposes, by whom, and with what support? That's what I want to know. Variability, intermittency, and nuance, all of those descriptors imply time. And time in gathering information, time in conversation, time in assessing goals. More time here as we understand what our clients' own preferred ways for communicating are patients, residents, habitual standards of behavior, their values, what can we know about that person. We see the emphasis on this arise when we think about um, our own decisional standards, you know, best interest standards, when we think about how a person, if, we, if I'm gonna step into the shoes of somebody else and substitute my decision for theirs, what I'm expected to be able to do and what I'm expected to know, to consider what a reasonable person might do under the circumstances, et cetera. So we see this here. Um, you know, we want, we, want to, we want to, if we have any information about what that person's values, goals, or preferences might be, we're going to prioritize those values, goals, and preferences. So, for example, we would encourage people to create a healthcare directive in which they name not only a proxy, but also give some information, like in a living will, about what kind of intervention they want at the end of their life, and maybe even why. And when they do so, then the, the decisional standard that we don't, that we, that we use in that case, we don't have to use a best interest standard, we can use a substituted judgment standard. We actually have some information about what that person's values might have been. So we can, we can apply that there. Confidentiality and autonomy, of course, even in the face of capacity, these, still th these are still things which adhere for attorneys. This is particularly um, important and meaningful that confidentiality applies in an ongoing way. So even if a person uh, uh, is experiencing some imposition on their decisional capacity in a, in a legal matter, um, that we would be able to uh, maintain confidentiality even if we needed to gather information from another source, so finding ways to, uh, to, to maintain that. And then, of course, uh, this is for all of us, <laughs> and maybe for all of us more so as consumers, as patients, or as residents than necessarily as uh, practitioners or professionals, but that we should all then therefore be planning ahead, have a healthcare directive, have given some information about our choices and values and preferences, and then have named somebody who might be able to step into our shoes and make a decision on our behalf if we are not able to. Of course, uh, there are some intersections here with informed consent in regard to, um, to medical capacity, so making a, a, a medical decision. Um, and here, you know, similar questions to the kinds of questions that attorneys are asking to uh, determine whether or not a person can give informed consent. Does a patient understand their situation? Um, do they appreciate consequences, risks, and benefits is what we're talking about there. Um, reasoning, so fully, full understanding. 
and then are they able to communicate their wishes in some way, wh whatever way that might be, um, is, is highly variable, but in some way. And I, I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about why this is so important to us at the Elder Justice Center, not least significantly because we get lots and lots of calls from people who have been given some information about decisional capacity or some outcome that they're told is related to an assessment of their capacity and they don't understand and they want to understand what the legal implications of that are and so they contact us on the helpline. That's one reason. Another reason is because we've seen some studies that demonstrate that autonomy can be a protective factor against abuse, at least a couple of them, and those are compelling. And it does make practical sense, very much so. To me, if I am allowed to participate in decision-making, informed decision-making, so I'm given information about risks and benefits, and I'm processing a decision related to those risks and benefits, I'm going to be attuned to what those risks are. If my ability to assert a decision is taken away from me and given to somebody else, I am not going to be aware of what those risks and benefits are. And that other person is going to be aware of them on my behalf. It absolutely makes sense that autonomy and safety are related in that way. And so that's something that we really recognize and think is critical here um, for a person to, to be able to, to receive information about those risks and benefits and to participate in their own safety. And when we when we, we spend a lot of time talking with advocates, both in domestic and sexual violence communities as well as elsewhere. Um, and this is, this is the way we talk with advocates about issues related to capacity. So as we intersect you know, within, within these realms, you know, the language that, uh, that we're using in, in human services is really oriented around person-centeredness and an awareness that these things are variable. So your colleagues here uh, who are providing advocacy in these contexts, in social services contexts, in county contexts, for on behalf of our colleagues in adult protection, and attorneys, this is the this is the lens that folks are using, um, and and they are many of the things that we've already talked about today. This idea that capacity can fluctuate and an increasing awareness that we have to be able to accommodate a wide range of determinations related to capacity in order to adequately speak to individuals' needs, um, that experience and education, literacy, language capacity, all these things are critically relevant in what we're trying to assert about whether or not a person is capable of making a decision or asserting one. Of course, not lost on you again, but something that we share with folks who may not have as much direct experience with these matters, but that capacity can be adversely affected in such a variety of ways. And sometimes we'll give examples of these instances as a way of illustrating. And so that for, for you, if you're working with folks who are sort of struggling with the fact that perhaps you can't give a global capacity declaration, maybe they're looking to you to say this person is incapacitated because that kind of an assertion would actually help make some other actions easier or help clear a path or something like that, that you know, really we're looking at all of these variables to make a consideration about a specified assertion related to capacity. And of course, these are all matters that impact capacity that uh, I talk with, uh, with clients about when they call the helpline. So these are some things that maybe you've talked with families about when they have questions about how to, how to understand a way a person is making decisions, um, and particularly older adults. I don't need to describe um, any of these things to you, as obviously, but you know these are impositions on capacity. Some of them are not reversible. My understanding of dementia is that this is generally the case, right? That the dementia is progressive in its various forms, and then some of them are, <laughs> you know, delirium, a symptom of, of reversible conditions, depression, an experience that's reversible. So if a person's capacity is being imposed upon because they're experiencing delirium, and the underlying infection or whatever it is is resolved and they return to a state of capacity in which they can assert their own decisions. If a person is depressed and their depression is treated, you know, they're able to assert more complex decisions, demonstrate a more complex understanding. So again, here the variability, and this is what we'll share sometimes with families who are calling with confusion related to um, what a person is allowed to make decisions about and, and, and what they feel a person maybe should not be allowed to make <laughs> decisions about. Um, for attorneys, I. I emphasize, and, w and when we're talking with other, uh, the other providers in, the so in social services contexts, um, there's, a, there's often a lot of question about like whose final responsibility is it to assess capacity? Where does the buck stop? Who's the final, who got who's the final say? Um, <laughs> the answer, unfortunately for all of us, is, is nobody gets the final say. In the legal context, of course, a court 
gets the final say. Um, and, and so, you know, to some extent, right, when we see there's a dispute that winds up in court, then there will ultimately be some sort of final say. But practically speaking, does the court get the final say? Um, I mean, to the extent that the court is really present in the daily lives and decision making of people, um, maybe so. But a lot of habits can exist in people's lives and their decisional expression um, that, that, that are practical daily habits about how people relate and make decisions. Um, and in, in those contexts, you know, a sort of customer culture has the final say ultimately about what's happening in families or what's happening for individual patients. So in the law courts, you know, in clinical settings, you know, physicians make a final, final determination, right? So it's, again, this question about who gets the final say, ha we have to specify <laughs> the final say about what, right? Are we talk what context are we talking about here? Um, and I also, I, ha I have to emphasize again in the law, as well as in all of our daily human interactions, we are assessing another person's capacity all the time. I mean, just to use a sort of in a plain language determination or plain language description, I'm assessing your capacity in the room because I'm trying to determine whether or not I'm connecting with folks who are listening in a conversation. I'm assessing the capacity of my conversational partner. I'm constantly assess assessing the capacity of my spouse throughout the house, <laughs> like trying to see like how directly is he examining his phone and can I, is he gonna remember what I tell him right now? Um, <laughs> bless him, <laughs> he, he I'm sure is doing the same thing. Absolutely certain. Uh, but uh, so these are kinds of interactions that I just want, I, 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 I kind of want to normalize for our colleagues who I think get really worried that they're going to make a mistake when they record an observation or make an assertion about somebody's ability to make a certain kind of decision because they don't have the same information that maybe I have as an attorney or that, that you may have as clinicians. So I do want to kind of normalize the idea that we're, we're, we're assessing capacity at various times for various purposes in various ways and all the time. So we all have some expertise in that regard, whether or not we are doing that assessment under certain specified circumstances or for certain specified specified purposes. Um, the issue with assessment screening tools, I was talking about this as a natural part of, of interaction, uh, but when I think about assessment screening tools then, I want to, I I want to not, no, not so much for you emphasize these matters, but then for us as ambassadors of this information to our colleagues. Because if you're here today to think and talk about capacity, you're already thinking very deeply about this issue. If you know that it's something that you want to think and talk more about, then I'm already not particularly concerned that you're casually employing assessment tools that are not appropriate for the situation that um, that you that that may be called for. But but there there can be a, a misunderstanding about what these assessment tools mean, what the results of assessments mean. Um, uh, in fact, from attorneys to clinicians, there can be a misunderstanding. And then from others, there can be a misunderstanding about who can administer these screening tools and how global the results or outcomes of them might be. So just for us to be aware, as people who may provide capacity assessments or interpret them for other people, that <laughs> I, I would say more information here, if, you, if, you, if you're able to provide it, can be better. Again, time here in explaining the results, the way that results might be limited, um, the way that the information that's being gathered um, might be limited, in fact, by what we can ask about um, or what the questions are. So again, we know that capacity assessments may not always be culturally adjusted. We also know that, that for that reason, they may perpetuate implicit bias. This is something that is reasonable for us then to take a particularly close look at the assessment tools that we like to use in our own practices, whether they're clinical practices or legal practices, to ensure that we're actually getting the information we think we're getting about how a person makes decisions related to that. So any, any, any I think, anything like uh, that, that sort of broadly gathers information in this way has these risks associated with it. So for that reason, you know, we talk about making sure that when assessments are offered, that we're really offering reflection on those observations. And I would just encourage folks to do that to the extent possible with individual patients and or families. Often it's, it, it are, it, or supporters of patients um, uh, that are maybe really needing information about both the applicability and the limitations of certain kinds of assessments about people's decision-making capabilities. Okay, time check. All right. 
time is one of the greatest challenges in application for us with regard to capacity and making, making inquiry about a person's decisional capabilities. And again, I don't have, uh, I don't have a terrific answer for that in, in, in the realm of those who are so time pressed. Um, I feel like uh, the structure that we've been able to create at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center is one response to this, and it's not the only response to the issue of impositions of time. Um, but to be able to have uh, in individual advocates who are directed specifically towards empathetic listening as a priority mo mode of advocacy and who see the experience of information sharing, storytelling, the narrative experience that individuals have in terms of processing information, making decisions, expressing their autonomy, characterizing their experience, that that's a critically important piece of advocacy that we do. It may be more important than any of the other pieces of advocacy that we do. And I say that recognizing that we provide limited purpose legal representation. But that empathetic listening piece is critically important and it's, it speaks to this issue of time, I think, which we just don't have a ton of. Um, and so all of the adjacent kinds of expressions that people might have about their cir circumstances, um, they can't always emerge if, if, if they don't have time to, if we don't give those, those expressions time. So in terms of making capacity assessments, of course, we emphasize this piece of time. The extent to which we're able to offer it, I think the better uh, result or more accurate result we can have. And of course, again, for those who are clinicians here, this is the, the way we make observations is not going to be mysterious to folks. When we talk with advocates, you know, we, we emphasize these very issues. We want to make sure we're making observations about some of these things and how we might um, record those observations. We try to give some, uh, some information about, but you know, how are people expressing short-term memories? How are they communicating? Are they oriented to time, place, purpose? And attorneys have different ways um, when working with clients in that context to make these kinds of, uh, of kind of preliminary assessments of decisional capacity and orientation. Um, some have kind of uh, approaches in which they, you know, ask people certain series of questions, you know, consistent and systematic across clients, try to, try to make sure that they're gathering similar information. Others have different ways. Many people just do this conversationally, again, make a determination about how a person is situated um, in that regard. And then often we're asked to um, make observations or, or give information regarding financial decision making in particular. And so I just like to share a sort of range of types of, capaci of, of uh, financial decisions. Again, implicating the wide continuum of capacity here that can be demonstrated to accomplish specific tasks. It's not even really enough to say that this person is incapacitated for the purposes of financial decision making. There's a huge range of types of financial decisions. I mean, we can say that if a person is totally incapacitated and, and for all types of financial decisions, including like managing small amounts of cash. But if a person can manage small amounts of cash or coins, then they're not incapacitated for all types of financial dis decisions, and we have to be more specific about what's, what they are, about the ways in which they are incapacitated, and maybe even more valuably, valuably be specific about the ways in which they retain capacity. Behavior observations, and then what information too? I just mentioned the uh, the information that can be shared by third parties to the extent that that information is made available to us, and oftentimes it's made available to us voluntarily by other people who say, "Oh, I can tell you about how this person thinks about, etc., or how they make decisions about." When the advocates are meeting with folks um, and the attorneys at Elder Justice, they generally try to make the following accommodations for cognitive impairment. So if we're working with somebody that we know to be cognitively impaired, um, then we want to make sure that we are in particular emphasizing these, um, some of these variables when we're meeting with folks to try to receive direction from them. And again, time, time here for all these things, making sure that we're setting an appropriate pace, that we're meeting in appropriate places, that we're meeting with appropriate, you know, supportive technologies, um, that we are spending enough time with concepts that the client needs. So if we have to, you know, if, we, if we're gonna talk about, um, you know, what it means to, um, uh, what it means uh, to authorize somebody to um, make uh, decisions about a bank account. If we need to talk about it several times, 
uh, you know, we can talk about the various types of decisions that might, might involve a bank account and how a person might gather information that they would need to make decisions about a bank account. So, you know, just to repeat, check in, talking a lot about things until we have a clear understanding that a person is is able to, is tracking, is asserting their own decision about something, or just has continual questions and for some reason is not or is not able to give direction. And then finally too, I, I want to point out, you know, decisional supports. So many of us make decisions with help in a lot of realms of our life and, and this is the case for many clients and patients as well. Is there somebody who they would like to consult before they assert a final decision? Is there somebody that they would like to gather information from and are they able to articulate that to us? Um, and then can we support that? How can we make sure that we're giving people time and space to engage the decisional supports that they need in order to assert a decision that's their own? So gathering what advice from what persons. And then of course, you know, what kind of concerns ultimately do we have? Do we have kind of mild concerns about a capacity to make certain kinds of decisions or something more than that? Or do we have severe concerns? And of course, documenting that. This is something we emphasize for advocates and I know for clinicians this was part of a process. I want to talk just now about supported decision making and then we'll just conclude with some time hopefully for some questions. Um, supported decision making is a philosophy that does what we effectively try to do at Elder Justice Center, which is a, a begin from a presumption of capacity and start by trying to emphasize what folks retain capacity to do and support that. Um, again, this is in recognition of the fact that people are generally happier and safer and have a higher quality of life when they're asserting their own decisions about their lives. Uh, so in instances of supported decision making, individuals might be using family, friends, kinship groups, or folks that they know in other contexts, other professionals, um, to make decisions. But ultimately the decision is theirs. It's not another person's decision that they're expressing, it's their own decision that they've ar arrived at via support, conversation, the kinds of ways that we all might make decisions um, about something that we weren't certain about. You know, big choices. Oh, maybe move, buy a new car. I'm going to ask a handful of people that I trust, what they like, recommendations, et cetera. This is what we're talking about. It's very straightforward. It's about receiving meaningful information from other people and incorporating that and then making a decision related to it. These are the kinds of ways that we all make decisions. So we want to make sure that when we're asking other people or we're assessing whether or not a person has the ability to make a decision, we're considering that that might be a part of their way of making a decision. This is uh, the idea that we, we really are, are, are um, acknowledging here when we talk about supported decision making. There are some jurisdictions who have what we would call supported decision making agreements in statute, sort of in the way that we have a statutory form power of attorney document in Minnesota. But we don't have a, s a s supported decision making agreement in statute in Minnesota, which actually leaves us open to create all different types of agreements. We've seen supported decision making agreements that are sort of standalone contracts. We've seen supported decision making agreements that are addenda to healthcare directives. There are all kinds of interesting ways then that people can create agreements with groups of supporters. Um, and so this is something that we are, are, are very interested in. Um, it's something that, that we're seeing given more and more attention to in human services and social services and something I think we should all, if you haven't been been aware of the discussion related to supported decision making and you have questions about it, I'd really encourage you to reach out. I'm happy to talk with you a little bit more about that. But these are the, the person-centered practices that, um, that, that we're moving towards in this conversation in the legal, con in the legal context. We have a Center for Excellence in Supported Decision Making in Minnesota, so if you're looking for additional information about supported decision making and how people might create those structures in their own lives, um, the Center for Excellence is a great resource for that. We also have a WINGS group in Minnesota, which is an acronym that stands for Working Interdisciplinary Network of Guardianship Stakeholders. And the WINGS group also talks about, uh, has a lot of resources about supported decision making and talks a lot about less restrictive alternatives to guardianship such as supported decision making. And in contrast to supported decision making, of course, we have substitute decision making. That's when we are having another person make a decision on behalf of someone else. And I talked a little bit about these decisional standards. Substituted judgment is a, a standard we'd prefer, of course, because it suggests that we have some information about a person's preferences. 
And then I just want to contrast those, <laughs> um, what we talked about with regard to supported decision making with guardianship and conservatorship. So in Minnesota, we have systems of guardianship and conservatorship, guardianship of the person, conservatorship of the estate, the resources, the assets. So in some states, those arrangements are referred to collectively either as guardianship or as conservatorship, and here we, di we divide and refer to both. So a guardian is a person who is appointed by a court to make decisions regarding the daily life of an individual, and a conservator is a person appointed by a court to make financial decisions for somebody. And in each of these arrangements, we're seeing a really significant imposition on a person's civil rights. Because when a person is placed in the context of a guardianship or in the context of a conservatorship, they are no longer making decisions about any of those realms of concern. And instead, another person is making decisions about all of those realms of concern. And so, in order for a court, a court to impose a guardianship, there have to be no less restrictive alternatives that would work to achieve the goals that a guardianship or conservatorship would be sought to achieve. So, uh, not only um, is, must there be some determination of incapacity for the purposes that are articulated in a guardianship petition in order, um, and that means that, th th so the, there the court actually has to make findings related to that, so a, a diagnosis is not enough. There actually have to be facts and evidence that suggest that a person is not able to engage in decisions in certain realms. And um, we have to speak specifically and directly to those. Um, but in addition to that determination, <laughs> and, and in that determination, you know, we have to use the range of tools that are available to us for decisional support but that there must also be no less restrictive alternative available to the guardianship in order for the court to, to impose it. And so there needs to be no way that we could use a healthcare directive, no way that we could use any other supported structure for decision making um, that would be meaningful to resolve an issue prior to the imposition of a guardianship or conservatorship, including technological tools here. Yes. You got it. Oh, we're over time. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, we'll wrap up now. Um, I want to make this particular emphasis because I think many of the instances in which we're asked to make capacity determinations are related to connections with guardianship and conservatorship. So simply consider when you're being asked specifically with relationship to determinations around guardianship and conservatorship, where else in our legal system do we see such outcomes of uh, impositions on rights that we see in guardianship and conservatorship? Almost nowhere else. I bet you can think of maybe one or two examples. Yeah, 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 you're right. The answer is being offered here, prison. Yep. So think this, this is the <laughs> just a, as a parting thought. Um, the, the, the depth of, of implication here when people are asking about capacity related to guardianship and conservatorship um, is significant, significant. Uh, I am over time, I apologize very much. Thank you so much. I'm available here if anybody has questions or I appreciate any feedback that you'd like to share. Um, and again, I just wanna say it's just tremendous honor to be able to spend time with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions or hang out um, and chat, but thank you for being here very much. Yeah.